Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Uh, Kim Hartwig. I'm the medical director of Nimipu Health, and I'm here this afternoon to give you some educational information about um, discontinuation of isolation for persons with COVID-19. There's this presentation contains a lot of information, not only about um, when or why we. Um, release somebody from monitoring, but um, also um, some background um, about the disease and uh, basic virus information um, just to help with your understanding. I think that as we um, begin to um, return to work, um, the and actually with any situation, the uh, better understanding that we have, the um, uh, more comfortable and confident we can be. Um, in, uh, in our situation. Um, so the first thing that I would like to um, share is that at this time, the um, data that we are using to make recommendations that we're receiving um, on a regular basis from the CDC uh, is very limited. And um, specifically with how long a person can shed the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, after an infection. But what I would like to um, help uh, you to understand today is that there are some key findings that we have um, been using for recommendations and I would like to um, share those with you today. Um, first, I would like to talk with you about the um, testing that we've conducted at Nimi Poo Health. Um, we have what's called an Abbott ID Now um, test and that allows us to uh, receive test results um, in as little as three minutes, but as long as 15 minutes, which has allowed us to um, uh, get results very quickly and make um, recommendations for community safety um, at, that, at that same time. Um, surrounding facilities um, don't have that capacity, but um, it's been uh, tremendously helpful um, going forward. So to date, we have um, conducted 188 um, COVID-19 tests. We've uh, received um, 18 positive results. The last positive result was received on, um, on May 19th, um, and it was a, a single case. And we have had 170, 170, excuse me, 170 negative tests, uh, which gives us a negative test result percentage of 90.43% and a positive test rate of 9.57%. Now those are larger than you would see in um, the other numbers that are being cited, um, but um, our N, which is our 188, is pretty small, um, but we do have the capacity to test and we're um, uh, feeling confident um, moving forward given that we've had um, such significant number of negative numbers for consecutive days. Um, so let me begin um, with the symptom-based uh, strategy um, to discontinue isolation for persons with um, COVID. Um, the first, there are, um, first key finding is that um, viral burden measured in upper respiratory specimen declines after the onset of illness. Now this data is from the CDC and it's unpublished. Um, and somebody might ask, why are you using unpublished data? Is that accurate and um, because it's the only data that we have and the CDC has made decisions to um, pub to um, distribute this data without going through the routine um, publishing um, criteria so that we could all use this data to, to make some informed decisions the CDC has been um, the um, primary reference source for all of this pandemic, um, for, for which we're very thankful, but, but the data that we're gonna look at today is um, uh, from the CDC and it's unpublished. So um, the first important um, bit of information, as I said, is that viral burden, so a virus is a, is a pathogen or a disease-causing um, particle, that cannot live on its own. It has to use our DNA and RNA to replicate itself, and if it doesn't have 
our DNA and RNA, then it cannot survive. And um, the uh, so when we become infected or exposed to a virus, that virus penetrates or gets inside of each of our cells, and it multiplies, unknowing to us, for um, up to seven to uh, 14 days. And as that virus is multiplying inside our cells, our bodies are not able to recognize that because our bodies and our immune system recognize ourself and don't normally harm ourselves with the exception of um, uh, immune um, conditions, autoimmune conditions. But, but generally speaking, viruses um, multiply inside our cells and so because they're inside our cells our body doesn't recognize that we have an infection whereas bacteria they can survive on on their by themselves and so they can survive out in our bloodstream which is why antibiotics work against bacteria bacteria um, and antibiotics are both in the bloodstream and so when we give you an antibiotic then it can combat the bacteria because they're in the same compartment but viruses have to be inside our cells to multiply. And um, so it, it uh, takes our body some time to combat uh, a virus because it's multiplying uninhibited. Un it doesn't have any um, uh, opposition uh, to multiplying. Um, and those viral particles are multiplying and, and copying um, within our cells. And when that number of copies of virus exceeds or surpasses or goes beyond the strength of our cell wall, then those cells rupture and we have these millions of viral particles that have been multiplying without our knowledge um, exposed into our bodies and that's when we manifest symptoms. That's when we show symptoms um, in runny nose, in a cough, in fever, um, all of the, the symptoms that we are monitoring for, um, for a um, an infection are then shown and that's our body's response uh, is it's really telling us that it's starting to fight an infection. So um, viral burden measured in upper respiratory specimen declines after the onset of illness. So I'll have you turn to this um, graph here um, that um, as you can see on the y-axis it's a logarithmic um, uh, graph of RNA, which is um, uh, genetic material, RNA copies in a swab, and across the bottom you can see days post symptom onset. Now the yellow dots are throat swabs and the brown dots are nasopharyngeal swabs. And somebody might ask, well we aren't using throat swabs for specimen, um, why is that on here? The, the swabs for some testing and um, thus included that in the data. But as you can see, the, um, the ability to detect RNA or genetic material on a swab was not present about until day two or three, but you can see just these three individual dots are present and the large majority of symptoms where we can actually detect the RNA in the virus don't become present until day four and five. And you can see that the concentration of presence of RNA increases as we get farther and farther away from the onset of, of symptoms uh, being started. And then you can also see that the of the symptoms is declining over time. Okay, and so that that really is the is the um, first point is that viral burden, so the the quantity of virus measured in upper respiratory specimen, the throat swabs and the nasopharyngeal swabs, declines after the onset of illness. So when our body is mounting an immune response, then the virus declines over time. At, at this time, uh, at this time, replication competent virus has not been successfully cultured more than nine days after the onset of illness. So replication competent virus is a key phrase in this um, bit of information. Um, replication competent means that the virus has the ability to multiply. And any, anything that can reproduce has the ability to live. If you don't 
reproduce, then eventually uh, the virus will die. And so um, replication competent virus, so virus that can multiply and has the ability to multiply, has not been successfully cultured more than nine days after the onset of illness. The statistically estimated likelihood of recovering replication competent virus approaches zero by day 10. And that's important um, because the, um, the symptom-based um, strategy to discontinue um, transmission-based precautions or um, somebody who might be able to transmit or um, pass on an infection include three criteria. One, three days has passed since recovery and recovery is defined as without a fever or um, uh, improvement of respiratory symptoms. I'm sorry, and not or. Um, without a fever and improvement of respiratory symptoms and has been at least 10 days since the symptoms first appeared. Okay, so replication competent virus has not been successfully cultured more than nine days after the onset of illness. Now, a culture is a gold standard in the infectious disease realm. When, when um, somebody gets a bladder infection, for example, there are common pathogens or bugs that cause that bladder infection. And based on the common pathogens, we providers select which antibiotic would, will be effective, effective against that particular pathogen or bug. If we are not certain about what pathogen or bug may be contributing to that infection, we will obtain a culture because the culture will allow us to one, know specifically what bug is causing the infection. And we can also do what's called sensitivities where we um, expose that um, bacteria to um, different types of antibiotics and identify if it's able to kill that pathogen or not. So um, keep, uh, just know that a culture is, um, is a gold standard in the infectious disease realm to help us to know if, if, if a substance is present or not, or if it's able to be um, really harmful or not. So let's look at this next um, slide. So um, this uh, shows uh, 0, 50, and 100% zero converted patients. Now, zero is serum, and converted is, is patients that have um, known um, infection, basically. And you can see that that infection, or that zero conversion, rather, doesn't become apparent in, in this particular study until day five. So even though we know that they're positive, right, because these are all positive patients, we know that they're positive, they didn't zero convert to, for us to detect it until day five. So somebody comes in and says, I, I was um, around a, a COVID positive patient yesterday, I need to get tested. Well, it's not gonna be helpful for us to test oftentimes in those, that first couple days because we need to allow your body time to develop a, an immune response for us to be able to um, uh, observe or um, receive a positive test. Okay, so with time, Almost all of these patients have zero converted, but it's taken up to two weeks for that to happen. But we know that they're positive. Excuse me. Um, on the x-axis, you can see that this is days after symptom onset. So symptoms started here as day one, day two, three, four, et cetera. And this um, particular um, study looked at throat swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs, and stool swabs. Now, as I said, a culture is a gold standard. So here, um, they were able to obtain a positive culture, and this is the negative culture um, realm. So um, uh, the purpose of this is to show, as I said, that, that um, replication competent virus has not been successfully cultured more than nine days after the onset of illness, and the statistically estimated likelihood of recovering replication competent virus approaches zero by days 10. So um, here, one day after onset, we couldn't get a culture. Two days after onset of symptoms, we couldn't get a culture. Three days after onset of symptoms, we could get a culture in, in a nasopharyngeal swab and in a throat swab. 
And we also were able to get negative uh, culture in the throat swab. Day four, positive nasopharyngeal, na uh, uh, positive in the throat swab. And, and then the remaining days, up to day eight, we could only obtain a culture, so replication, replication uh, capable virus, uh, only in the nasopharyngeal swab. And so there was a question um, in a prior presentation, well, throat swabs um, we've not used, and this is partly why we've not used a throat swab, because even though there's a portion of the pharynx that's in the throat, the nasopharyngeal swab has, has been able to provide a better representation of uh, presence of an infection. But the culture, we were not able to culture anything beyond day eight. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that the negative cultures that we're getting, these gray dots here, this is all stool, okay? Not able to obtain um, viral particles or grow par viral particles, excuse me, in a stool specimen. And this is a, a similar uh, depiction, successfully cultured uh, one, which is this column here, is no, it was not cultured. Two is yes, was cultured. And these are days post onset of symptoms. And you can see here that this last culture date was at day nine, which is why we said that we um, cannot a replication competent virus has not been successfully cultured more than 90 days after the onset of illness. So we cannot get the virus to grow any more in, in a culture after nine days. So as the likelihood of isolating replication competent virus decreases, so with after symptom onset is that as the replication uh, competent virus numbers decrease. Anti-SARS-CoV-2, um, so anti, so SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. Anti-SARS-CoV-2 are the antibodies that we make to combat the virus, to fight the virus. And we make two types of antibodies um, initially. IgM, which is a, an acute um, phase antibody, which those are antibodies that we make right after we've been exposed to the infection and IgG are the memory antibodies. Um, and the anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgG and IgM um, can be detected in an increasing number of people who are recovering from the infection as the virus particle number goes down or antibody uh, particle number goes up, which is how we clear an infection. Now our immune systems are meant, are made rather, to respond in a, in a quicker, manner um, in subsequent exposures. So when we first see the SARS-CoV virus, for example, our immune systems may not respond, uh, they're gonna respond, um, God willing, by helping us clear it, but the second time that we see that virus, our immune systems are gonna respond more quickly and in a more heightened fashion. And that's true for subsequent exposures. That's part of the reason, or is the reason rather, why we give kids multiple vaccines is that we are exposing them to a little bit of a pathogen or a bug and so that their immune systems can see that, recognize it, and then create antibodies to fight that off. The next time we give the vaccine, their body's going to make more antibodies in a quicker fashion and greater number because that's how our immune systems are made to work. And the third vaccine similar, a quicker fashion and a more and a higher magnitude of response. So um, as the viral uh, replication competent virus decreases, our antibodies um, are increasing. And um, attempts to culture the virus from upper respiratory specimen have been largely unsuccessful when the viral burden is low, but in detectable ranges. So let's look at the next the next graph here. So this is telling us that even though the viral burden is detected, it's, it's at a lower threshold than can be cultured. And again, culture, a, 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 a pathogen that is culturable is 
a pathogen that can be harmful. So if it can't multiply, then the, the chance that it's going to be harmful to us is very, very, very low. So attempts to culture virus from upper respiratory specimen has been largely unsuccessful when viral burden is low, but in detectable ranges. Now, uh, this uh, particular graph shows, um, on the y-axis, it shows CT uh, patient specimen. And a CT value is the number of application cycles to reach a fixed signal threshold. Now this um, particular study set the threshold at 33 CT. So those amplication cycles um, have been um, uh, set um, because below that value, as you can see, we, we can, uh, um, so recovery means able to culture, non-recovery means not able to culture. And these are three, so again, very, very small spot sample but reproducible on these three specimen at that, at that range. And so um, culturable, not culturable. In this specimen, culturable, not culturable. And below that 33 set range, you can see that the culturable specimen is extremely low with just a single dot um, in, in, uh, in those columns. The other thing that I'd like for you to, to notice is that um, these p-values here, a p-value that is statistically significant that gives us confidence, and a p-value tells us that there, the chance of this being, um, of, of us getting a result by chance is 95% is confidence. So a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is the standard, and these p-values are 0 0.092. 0 0.0001, 0 0.0003. So, so st show some significant, uh, so some uh, statistical significance. But again, you know, very low numbers. But this is all that all that we have. So, um, at w at a CT of 33 cutoff, we are able to culture viral um, virus here, but we still have detectable virus here. That's what these black dots are, but not enough to culture. And so even though we have a uh, viral burden that's low, we can't, the, the, our ability to culture the specimen is, um, is low, even though the virus particles are in detectable ranges. So there's a threshold where the virus can multiply, and that's, um, this is, as I said, preliminary data, but gives us some information that even when we still have a little bit of virus, we still can't, um, may not be uh, contagious. So following recovery from, a, from clinical illness, many patients no longer have detectable viral RNA in upper respiratory specimen. Among those who continue to have detectable RNA, concentrations of detectable RNA three days following recovery are generally in a range at which replication competent virus is not, has not been reliably isolated by the CDC. Okay, this is unpublished data by the CDC, but three days after recovery, and recovery from our um, definition is based on no fever and uh, resolution or um, uh, disappearance of respiratory symptoms, um, cough, shortness of breath. And it's been at least 10 days since they've passed, uh, since they, their symptoms first appeared. So if we can't um, detect RNA, which is the protein within the virus particle, three days following recovery, then we can safely say that a person doesn't have a viable or replication, replicable virus present, which means that they're not infective. They can't, they're not contagious, not harmful. And so that, that's, the, that's the, the criteria for symptom-based strategy is at least three days have passed since recovery of symptoms, and recovery is no fever and, and improvement of respiratory symptoms, and at least 10 days since the onset of that symptoms first appeared. Um, okay, 
And there, there is a, no clear correlation has been described between the length of illness and duration of post-recovery shedding of detectable viral RNA in upper respiratory specimen. So this tells us that we really uh, don't know, no clear correlation, which means that we have some information, but we don't know with, with certainty um, how long an illness occurs and how long they're going to shed the virus. But what we do know is that that um, replication competent virus cannot be um, grown or cultured beyond day nine. So even though, as you can see here, um, the uh, positivity of the uh, PCR tests so 100% positive, all the cases involved in this study were all had positive PCR tests. And then here, weeks after onset, you can see that their tests are positive at 100% in week one. Week two, it goes down to about 90%. At week about 65, four, it's about 30%. At week five, it's down around 10%. At week six, it, it gets down to zero. So doing a PCR test, which is the test that we have to check for COVID, is not helpful in a situation because it's, it's going to be detectable all the way up to week six. So retesting a positive individual is our bodies break down the virus. We're still, we still may have some of that, um, of that uh, viral RNA present. But that doesn't mean that you're infective. It doesn't mean that you're contagious. It doesn't mean that you're harmful. Um, a similar circumstance happens with tuberculosis. We test for tuberculosis and we find it. We don't test you again because it's gonna be positive. And that can So that happens also in TB. Once you become positive, we don't retest you again because you can carry uh, particles of TB that react and make the test positive for weeks, months, and sometimes years. So this is why we aren't retesting patients who have been positive um, in, uh, in, uh, in these cases. And um, the other thing that I like to relay, and this is the, um, uh, last point from the um, CDC uh, um, recommendations are that infectious virus has not been cultured from urine or reliably cultured from feces. These potential um, sources pose minimal, if any, risk of transmitting infection, and any risk can be sufficiently mitigated or inhibited or changed by good hand hygiene. So that this infection has not been able to be cultured, which is the gold standard in the infectious realm, from urine or reliably from stool. And if there was any transmission, if you practice good hand hygiene habits, then you're gonna significantly reduce, if not eliminate, that risk. Okay, the other thing that I would like to relay is that um, we, um, as a tribal entity, have um, taken several measures to try to protect um, our employees and our patients and our patrons that um, are using our services. And I want to explain um, what the uh, CDC Control and Prevention of National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health um, describe the hierarchy of controls uh, components. So uh, hierarchy of controls components, you can see on the left side that these are the most effective controls and uh, in blue and the least effective means of control are on the, in the red. So the most effective uh, methods of control are elimination and substitution. Now, with this virus, we cannot remove, replace, or design out hazards for the COVID virus. The COVID virus is here, and um, it's not going away. All that we're doing really is, is um, preparing for uh, 
the next wave or the um, next round because like the H1N1 um, flu vaccine or flu infection, we're still seeing H1N1 cases now, almost 11 years later. So this is not something that's going to go away, but we can prepare um, to um, identify and confine cases in a, in a quick manner to hopefully prevent, prevent spread. So uh, back to the control components. So elimination and substitution, this is the greatest and most effective protective measure that we can use um, uh, in, a, in a hazard. As I said, we cannot eliminate or substitute the COVID virus, unfortunately, um, so that most effective realm is not possible. But the next effective means is here in the yellow. It's engineering. So removes or reduces the hazard or places a barrier be between the worker and the hazard. Excuse me. And the tribe is, has, and the and Nipu Health have taken, have made measures to significantly reduce uh, risk by placing barriers between the worker and the hazard or um, uh, the social distancing is another means of um, removing or reducing risk um, and we can't completely eliminate this but we can lower our risks and that's really what the hand hygiene is for covering your cough or sneeze with a tissue and washing your hands um, staying home when you're sick um, all of those are means that we can reduce risk and that's really what all of the measures that we're taking are about. So the engineering um, methods that are in place that the tribe is putting up uh, sneeze guards and partitions in offices to try to um, reduce, reduce that um, risk as much as we can. Now the least effective means of protection are administrative and PPE. So this limits or protects against exposure to the hazard when it cannot be completely eliminated. So PPE is something that we all have control of and it feels like PPE, which is personal protective equipment, we feel like that is making us safe and it, it does protect us, but it's the least effective mode of protecting us or method of protecting us um, because we can control it. We can choose to put on the N95. We can put on goggles. We can use gloves. We can, so those things are important if we have to be exposed to that. But our um, goal is to reduce that exposure as much as we can. And the hand hygiene, the um, coughing and sneezing into a tissue and then washing your hands, um, all of those measures, staying home when you're sick, those measures really are, are much more effective than using an N95 mask. Now, as a healthcare worker, we have to be exposed because we're here to help and that's our commitment. So we're gonna use the PPE because we can't remove, um, re remove that exposure. But what we can do and what we've done at Nimipu Health is we have an, ice, an ice dedicated um, respiratory uh, hallway and have rooms dedicated just to our respiratory patients and our respiratory patients are requested to call before they come in so that we can prepare for your arrival and you might see us dressed with masks or, or uh, face shield, um, gloves and gown as we protect ourselves because we need to maintain our health so that we can continue to help you. But we're asking our respiratory patients to call the clinic before you arrive so that we can have you enter in the back of the clinic to access those respiratory dedicated rooms to help reduce spread and protect the rest of the clinic. So that, that um, engineering mean or means is, is helping reduce risk. So that's, that's an example. But I, I just want to reiterate that the um, engineering methods of protection are much more effective than PPE that we might use. And then the last thing that I want to share are the things that we have been doing to prepare for your return. Now this is, these are CDC recommendations and the purpose of this tool is to assist employers in making reopening decisions during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially to protect vulnerable workers. It's important to check with state and local health officials and other partners to determine the most appropriate actions while adjusting to meet the unique needs and circumstances of the local community. And, and the, the state and local health official um, 
relationship with uh, Mimi Poo Health has been um, significantly important in our being prepared and managing this pandemic. And um, I just want to um, thank the local officials for helping us to um, get, get through this. Um, so the first things that we should consider for reopening um, are, uh, will reopening be consistent with um, applicable state and local orders? Yes and yes, that's state and tribal orders. Are you ready to protect employees at higher risk for severe illnesses? Yes, we're prepared to do that uh, here at the tribe. Um, our, in, the, in the middle column, are um, recommended health and safety actions in place? Um, are, are we promoting healthy um, hygiene practices such as hand washing and employees wearing a cloth face covering? Yes, we're doing that. Are we intensifying cleaning and disinfection and ventilation? Yes. Uh, we are doing that and are looking um, very closely at ventilation um, in the in the uh, tribal offices and are trying to mitigate or resolve um, any of those issues. And we're also using um, an atomizer, which uh, destabilizes the um, virus uh, to help with disinfection in uh, both Nimi Poo Health um, at the um, tribal offices and I believe at Enterprises. So we're um, utilizing um, science to help with that disinfection process. Are you encouraging social distancing and enhancing spacing between employees, including through physical barriers, changing layout of workspaces, encouraging telework, closing or limiting access to communal spaces? Those are spaces that people um, use uh, together, such as at a water station or um, drinking fountain or the coffee uh, maker or refrigerate, shared refrigerator, um, are we limiting access to those? Um, staggering shifts and breaks and limiting large events when and where feasible. Yes, we are doing that. Are we uh, considering modifying uh, ho uh, travel and commuting practices? Yes, we are doing that. Have we trained all employees on health and safety protocols? They're, the managers are, are currently um, setting up uh, those safety protocols and educational um, uh, that ed educational information to help make sure that, that um, our employees feel confident in and understand the health and safety protocols to uh, reduce and mitigate um, this virus. But we've been doing this all along in our in our homes, in um, going grocery shopping. You know, you're you're wearing a mask when you go grocery shopping, or you're washing your hands with sanitizer when you get back into your car. Um, you have. Or my auntie gave me Lysol to put in my car. I have a pair of gloves to use when I go get gas and, and um, turn it inside out. And just so you know, uh, uh, gloves can be re-sanitized with um, hand sanitizer. So I've, I've done that to um, not be wasteful in, in, uh, in that protective um, equipment. So we've done all of that. And then the third column is, is ongoing monitoring in place. Have we developed and implemented procedures to check for signs and symptoms of employees daily upon arrival? So um, a temperature assessment is going to be conducted. There's a symptom um, management or a checklist that, that employees will have to go through and self-report um, if they have symptoms. And if you have symptoms, um, native or not, and you're an employee of the Nez Perce tribe, we can help you with testing if you do have uh, have symptoms or need need an assessment during this um, state of emergency. Um, non beneficiaries are able to be uh, to be uh, tested at Nimi Poo Health. Employees of Nest Per Tribe, native or non native, can be tested for COVID nineteen at Nimi Poo Health uh, during this state of emergency. Encourage anyone who is sick to stay home. Um, uh, a lot of people like to push through and, and not, not miss work. Uh, we would ask at this time that if you are ill, that you remain home to avoid uh, potential spread and keep our uh, work environment safe. And have a plan in place and if, if an employee does get sick. Um, regularly communicate and monitor developments with local um, authorities and employees. I jokingly said today that that's really become my job. 
to monitor developments and and uh, communicate with uh, local authorities, which is which is fine. I want to do um, what I can to help uh, keep our community safe. Um, monitor employee absences and have flexible leave policies and practices. We have been very generous with leave as we have uh, developed plans to um, uh, help combat. Uh, this virus as an organization and be ready to consult with local health authorities if there are cases in the facility or an increased cases in the local area and we are we do have those channels of communication open um, so I would just like to um, give uh, you some reassurance about the preparation that we've been doing to uh, welcome our employees back and things that we have in place to help um, identify early and confine, confine um, a uh, person who may become ill uh, with uh, COVID-19. And I, I also would like you to know that COVID-19 is not the only thing on my differential when somebody comes in for um, an illness. And a differential is a differential diagnosis. It's a list of things that I, that I need to consider um, and either rule in or rule out so that I can I can narrow down what's going on with the patient. So for example, if somebody comes in with a cough, um, my differential uh, might be um, allergies, it might be uh, pneumonia, um, it might be um, reflux or heartburn, um, it, it, uh, depending on if there's uh, fever or not, it might be a sinus infection, from postnasal drip, so I need, in, as a provider, I make make a list of things that I'm considering with this complaint. And yes, COVID is on our list, and right now it's at the top of almost every list because of of the of the concern with this infection. But it's not the only thing on our list. So just because somebody has a cough doesn't mean that they have COVID. Just because somebody has a fever doesn't mean that they have COVID. But can it be, can it mean that they can they have it yes it can but there are also other another list long list of things that can contribute to those symptoms so we need to not um, rush to assume that just because somebody has a fever or because somebody has a cough or somebody has shortness of breath that, that they have covid and know with confidence that after that 10 day window that patient is is no longer um, infective or, or harmful and um, so I wanted to um, take the time uh, tonight to just give um, some educational information about um, the virus and um, help you understand why we're letting people come back without retesting. Um, there is a test-based strategy that I'm gonna tell you, but we aren't gonna use that because we don't have the capacity to um, use three tests on every patient. If we had unlimited testing material, that would be a way that we might um, be able to uh, use. However, I, in, the, in the data that I shared, th that RNA test can be positive for up to six weeks after without you having active uh, viral present. So I I'm not sure that I would use that even if we did have the testing capacity just for that, um, for that, uh, that reason. One other thing that I want to share is that if somebody has a lab convert, confirmed COVID-19, so they've had a lab test and they've found to be positive for COVID-19, but they have not had any symptoms, so they, they um, have been asymptomatic, um, those patients have, have to have 10 days pass since the date of their first positive uh, diagnostic test, assuming that they haven't subsequently had symptoms. If they have had symptoms, then um, we adjust that timeline based on symptom onset with the symptom-based strategy that we just reviewed. Um, but we, uh, after that 10 days have passed since their positive test, and if they never develop symptoms, then they can resume regular um, activity. If they do develop symptoms, then we go back to the symptom-based strategy that I just explained, and their 10 days starts at the first onset of their symptoms. So that's the uh, only other uh, caveat. I'd also like to share um, what uh, optometry is doing um, as they gradually increase um, services for non-urgent appointments. Um, hours are gonna be the same, eight to 12 and one to 4.30, Monday through Friday. 
They're available at 208-1-4965. Um, the optometry clinic door will remain locked at this time. Um, they strongly recommend that you, that you, you call uh, before you head to the clinic. They're not currently taking any walk-ins unless there's an urgent or emergent care that is needed. Appointment priority will be given to medically necessary cases. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to meet all uh, your needs at this time and some appointments may be canceled. We're currently scheduling appointments for um, optical visits, um, eyeglass repair or ordering. For glasses or contacts that are ready for pickup, we'll be shipping them to you or scheduling curbside pickup. We ask you to wear a mask to your appointment, which is the same for all of Nimi Poo Health. When you come, we'd ask that you wear a mask. Um, due to the nature of, of our work, proper social distancing cannot be done. Uh, this is an optometry again. Cannot be done throughout your visit at Nimi Poo Health Optometry. Please protect you, uh, help us protect you and help us continue to provide care for Nimi Poo Health. Uh, we ask that you only have up to one person accompanying you during your visit. For family exam appointments, this means one minor and one guardian maximum in the clinic at a time. You may be asked to wait in your car for your appointment to meet social distancing measures. We're able to accept payment over the phone. Some expired glasses prescription can be extended. As always, Nimi Poo Health Optometry is here if you need us. If you have any questions about your specific situation, do not hesitate to call. And Nimi Poo Health is beginning to um, schedule well uh, appointments um, next week. Um, and we are uh, going to gradually um, phase uh, in as we monitor, um, phase in uh, routine appointments um, because we know that uh, you all um, need care and we want to provide that, but we also want you to remain safe. So we're going to ask that the, the healthy people without um, significant risk factors um, come in um, as we uh, monitor the situation and as we um, open up um, uh, business uh, to our new normal. That's all I have. <laughs> Is it? Are there any questions? If you want to answer questions, there were a couple. Okay. Um, the first one you pretty much answered, but it says. Is there a different testing technique between these types of tests? I've noticed some people tested elsewhere have been swabbed deep into their nose, whereas when tested at Nimi Poo Health, it only slightly tickles the nose a little at the entrance. Does that affect accuracy? So it depends on the type of test that they're using. So the um, state labs don't have the rapid test. They have to use the nasopharyngeal swab. So if I were to cut you down the middle, this is the back of your head, and this is your nose. Um, if you go up into your nose, the, the um, farthest back portion or tube, if you will, that goes down into your lungs is um, your pharynx. You have a nasal pharynx, you have an oral pharynx where your lab, or I'm sorry, where your mouth opens up into. The, the test that the state has requires that you go back into the nares or into the nose and get back to the nasal pharynx. And so that's that deeper swab. Our um, ID now analyzer, as well as our rapid strep, or I'm sorry, our rapid flu um, analyzer, which we just got this last flu season, only requires an anterior nose swab. So the this uh, mucus specimen from the just from the nose is sufficient to um, run that test. So it depends on which test you're using, and it's. The um, analyzer that we have actually is not for the nasopharyngeal, it's for the nose. So the, there is a difference and it's the, it's the tests that are being ran. If you test positive and recover, are you immune? That's a, so if you test positive um, and recover, are you immune? Um, we don't quite know the answer to that because people can get the flu again and again even though they've already had it that's a that's a question that we're only going to be able to answer with time the hope is is that if you've had the infection and you've recovered that if you do god forbid get another infection that that infection is less severe or you have uh, minimal symptoms but we really do, we really don't know the answer to that question yet 
I heard you can take aspirin and blood thinner to eliminate the vivid bacteria, they call it. Is this possible? And if allergy to aspirin, what medicine is equivalent? Vivid bacteria. So the infection, it, it said bacteria, right? Yeah, so the infection is not a bacteria, uh, first of all. And vivid bacteria, I'm not exactly sure what that is describing. If that um, viral particle number is great, and I haven't um, seen any um, antiplatelet, so um, I guess my assumption, not knowing or looking at the data, is that the um, aspirin has antiplatelet activity um, and platelets are involved in uh, forming blood clots. And there have been some cases of COVID that have been linked to um, clots, um, but I don't know that specific um, protective measure. Um, I can certainly look it up and, and reply um, on the Facebook page to see if there's any, if I have any more to add, but um, that isn't, that isn't something, a recommendation that I've, that I've seen or would give at this time. All right. Well, I uh, hope you all have a good uh, weekend and thank you for joining us tonight.